architecture. Okay, so all the uh, topics uh, what I covered and what I'm going to cover today and tomorrow. So all is like a, a general topic only. Okay, so moving on to the third chapter, right? Current, I mean, it will be much interesting. So I don't think that why the subject is like a, uh, like a, I mean, why it is like a little bit difficult. I mean, as far as like today's sessions. Uh, it's all about only general information. Okay, so maybe right Saturday we will move on to chapter um, three. So where right we will just try to solve some interesting problems. Okay, uh, now right I will continue with the uh, last class. Okay, is it visible? Guys, the screen is visible. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so this uh, this is what we have started, right? Whenever right, uh, we are just going to design a computer architecture instruction set. It, uh, it just plays a vital role, and when you just go with the instruction set architecture, the first one is the classes of ISA. Uh, in general, right, we have two classes. One is the load store architecture, another one is the register memory architecture. This is the first point. And the second thing is the memory addressing. So I, I told you, right, it should be memory aligned. And, uh, and also I differentiated with respect to ARM and with respect to the internal processors. So when you just go with the ARM, clearly it is memory aligned. So which means, right, uh, so this is what I told you, right, so this case. So even when it is two bytes, so this will be wasted. These two bytes uh, will be allocated for integers. So such kind of alignment should be there in case of other uh, oriented, but it is not with respect to Cisco oriented. The next one is the addressing mode. So addressing mode just is tell about uh, how to specify the operand foreign instructions. So or else what are the different ways to specify the operand foreign instructions? So of that right, the major category they have been classified into registers immediate and the displacement and we have seen few uh, examples uh, of those uh, addressing modes and the next is the uh, types and size of the operands so when you are going to work uh, the types and the size of the operand is a matter uh, like the data types and the size like it's going to be 8 or 16 or 32 or 64 bit it also a uh, matters next one is the operation what kind of operation does the instruction does um, so like a data transfer or arithmetic, logical, control and the floating point. I mean, these are the basic operations that can be done with any instruction set, whether it is a risk or system based architecture. So these are the basic operations uh, that has to be done. And these are all the example of instruction for the MIPS architecture. I told you already. So in your textbook, uh, one of the examples we are going to use is completely based on uh, MIPS. It's again a risk based architecture. So these are the instruction sets. Uh, I told you right that this data transfer, arithmetic and logical instructions, control instructions, floating point operations. So uh, these are the instructions that comes under MIPS. So when from the chapter three onwards, we will use few instructions from this to solve the given problem. Next one is the control flow instructions. Uh, when you go with the control flow instructions, I told you right two things. One is conditional and unconditional jumps conditionals uh, uh, like based on the uh, conditional flags okay and again that differs with respect to architecture also because when you go with the MIPS the conditional branches will happens with respect to the content of the registers but in case of ARMS and the 886 architectures it is purely depends upon the flag there I mean the flag here in sense uh, like a zero flag assigned flag overflow so those things okay in 886 and ARM it is purely towards uh, condition code, but in case of MRPS, it is purely with respect to the content of the registers. Okay, so the last one is encoding the ISA, that is the instruction set architecture. So far, right, I gave an example like this. Um, this is, I mean, whenever you're just going for, going, going for an ISA, so we have two basic choices for encoding. One is a uh, fixed length, another one is the variable length. So what is that? 
I already differentiated, right? When you just go with ARM-based architecture, all the instructions, so whatever the instructions we are saying, so all the instructions are of 32 bit. If it is a, assume that it, if it is a 32 bit processor, if a ARM core is a 32 bit processor, the most of the, all the instruction size is going to be a 32 bit. So which means how much? So it's a oh, sorry, four byte length. So moving on to variable length, so the instruction length may vary. The best example is the Intel. So uh, it may vary from one byte to 18 bytes. Okay. So, so when you are going for encoding the ISA, two cas, one is the fixed length, another one is the variable length. So before that, what is the encoding here? Which means, so uh, like I explained this. So, so far, right, we have these two things. We have uh, okay R not comma R one comma R two. So this is what this is the assembly language programming. What it has to be done? It has to be converted to a machine code. Okay. So this ALP has to get converted to a machine code. So that right we are saying it as encoding. Okay. So when we are encoding, so which is which is nothing but what all will be in terms of ones and zeros. Okay. So if it is thirty two. Assume that if it is going to be a 32 bit, so we have a 32 bit data here. So on the whole, right, we will have a 32 bit data. Here, right, it may vary. It's like 1 by 2, 80 bytes. So if you take um, MIPS instruction set architecture format, okay, any, any, anything you take, okay, let it be. This is for uh, instruction format. And here, here are specified, this is for the register addressing mode, and this is for the immediate, I is for immediate, and J is for the jump. So here, right, they given clearly as 0 to 31. So 0 to 31, it's a 32 bit. I told you, right, this is going to be a 32 bit. So this opcode part, this tell about what operation we are going to do. So here, right, this is going to be a, uh, like, add operations. And this is what RS is a source register, temporary register, destination register. Okay, so those things are all registers. As here, right, we are seeing right. So these are all the registers. And yes, some AT, uh, it's like a shift amount. Okay, so just when you go with the uh, uh, shift amount, um, see, uh, shift amount you know it, right? I mean, you can you, you, uh, you come across with an example like this. Add R not comma R one comma R two. Uh, just we need to shift it by three times. So like this, right? We are doing it, isn't it? Okay. So this is how many times we are going to do, and what is that function we are? Uh, or this is the shift function we are going to do. Okay. So uh, I mean this one. So this is the basic instruction format. It may varies. You got it. So it may clearly varies. But right, uh, it is um, it just purely depends upon the instruction. But basic thing is like you have this. So when you note, uh, suppose if you note here, 16 to 20, uh, yeah, 16 to 20 we have. So how many bits we have? 16, uh, 16, 19, 18, 19, 20. So five bits. Can anyone say why they have added five bits for this T? Similarly here also five bit, and similarly five bit. Why? 32 registers. Come again? 32 registers. Yeah, right. You have 32 registers. So it is more than enough with the five bits we can say it. Say for example, if I made this as this particular bit as 000, for example, I'm saying, so maybe this may refer to R0 register. If it is 0001, it is going to be R1 registers like this. You got it or not? Okay. So that's why, right? It is like this, and our code also they are given. Maybe right those those many operations we have, so that's why right these many bits have been allocated for the our code. Okay, so similarly we just go with the um, immediate instructions. We have this. Okay, uh, our code will be there, RS will be there under the temporary registers here. Immediate. Uh, what I meant? What is immediate here? The constant. constant values. Okay, so directly right the constant values. And here you have to be very careful. So, uh, I mean, how many uh, 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 value they have given? I mean, how many bits have been allocated? 16 bits. 16 bit, okay. So, which means, right, when you want to specify a constant value, maximum of 16 bit only you can do it. We cannot go for other, again, a 32 bit uh, things. Okay. 
So maybe right, you may get a question on this also. Clear. So only right maximum we need to go for only a 16 bit uh, immediate data. We can't go more than that. So and when you just go with the jump, so this what? So what is that jump? Whether it is a branch not equal or a normal jump or whatever it is. And here to which address we need to uh, switch over. Okay. So this one. And similarly, this is for the floating point registers and the immediate. Okay. So the, uh, normally, right, whenever you have an instructions, so all the instructions at the last stage, right, it will be converted to a machine code. When it is converting, right, there will be some format to convert. I think, uh, yeah, like in previous syllabus, under we have this. So whatever the instructions we are given, you are supposed to convert to a machine code. That is a, a, a point over there. But here, right, you just done. Uh, this is the way that it has to. It will be converted. Okay. Uh, okay, so these are the base things with respect to the instruction set architectures. So I repeat, one is the classes of uh, uh, instruction, uh, classes of IAC. The next one is the addressing, uh, memory addressing, addressing modes, and types and size of operands, the operations, and control flow instructions, and finally encoding the IAC. So I think it's seven steps you may get it. Okay. So, so let me quickly uh, like a brief out uh, the some important functional requirements again right we have seen like different classes of computers one is the personal mobile device general purpose uh, desktop servers clusters and the embedded computer i think we have seen these five devices again it purely depends upon the applications uh, where we are not going to use accordingly right it will be i mean whatever the factors or uh, performance factors we need to evolve it so Accordingly, right, we need to consider. Say, for example, when you just go with the personal mobile devices, uh, real time performance that is a, a important uh, case with respect to your mobile devices. But in case of general purpose, so uh, we have, I mean, it is it's a balanced performance and it should be suitable for a video graphics audience only those things. Okay. If it is case of servers, so it support for database and the transaction processing. At the same time, it is for reliability and availability and scalability. These two, these three are major factors with respect to the servers. But with respect to desktop, these things are needed: scalability or availability or reliability, because you are the only person who is going to rely on this. But when you just take a servers and all, multiple post, multiple persons is going to rely on that. So probably that the reliability and at the same time availability. So all those things are the matters. Moving on to backward scale computers, throughput. So because it's a request, so we are going to get so many requests. So how many requests it has been processed per seconds or something that is very, very important for backward scale computers. And the last one is the embedded computing. So when you again going for embedded computing, this is very important, the real time constraints. Okay. At the same time, power has to be limited and some mechanism that we need, I mean, is needed for the power because most of the cases when you take an embedded computing, it is a battery operated place. And uh, another one is right, uh, it will be in an uh, unmanned uh, environment. So whenever right, we are just going to, uh, if you take a desktop or a laptop or a scale computer, whatever it is, it may be in our hands. So right, periodically we can give a power or uh, whatever we want. But with respect to embedded computings, so most of the devices, it's battery operated. And the second thing is that it will be in the unmanned positions, somewhere we will keep it up and it has to be taken. So the power plays a vital role when it is go with the embedded computings. And again, right, uh, we cannot do something over the chip, only we can, with respect to the applications, we have to do it. That is very important for embedded computings. Okay. So this is uh, with respect to the devices. And other than that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, software aspects uh, generally they are given the level of software compatibility, um, a programming language, the object code are binary compatible, uh, and the operating system requirements. Uh, I told you, right, the platform independent, all those things, and the address space. Uh, this one, right, uh, I don't know, I'm, uh, like, uh, I don't know whether I mentioned or not. Is that uh, normally, right? Uh, you, um, if you take any microprocessor, um, uh, like some two to three numbers will be associated with that. They will say, right, assume it's an 8-bit microprocessor, the data bus. So these are the commonly used ones. The size is 8-bit. 
the address bus i don't know whether you read so address bus is 16 bit you take like this on the io is 8 bit can you uh, can you say what this are all what is here 8 bit because any take is so far i'm discussing on a 32 bit processor I'm just saying like this, right? Intel R64 bit, R32 bit. So what does it mean? When you say some processor has a 32 bit, so what that 32 bit refers? Size of the instruction. Size of the instructions. Is it right? Bandwidth or number of instruction it can perform. Uh -huh. Anything else? Um, see, it is not is not about the size of the instructions uh, because thirty two bit means don't think that is a thirty two bit. Uh, it is almost with respect to the size of the data it is going to get operated. Okay, so keep remember this. Clear? Yeah. Because uh, I, I, I mean, I, I mean, we, uh, unless we go with an example, when you go with an Intel, I turn one to eighteen byte. Will it get mad? But I'm just commonly saying Intel is a sixteen bit processor. Are a 32 bit processor here where it maps? Okay, when you go with the now and I'm saying it is a 32 bit, okay, your instruction size is also 32 bit. So maybe right, you can compare like this. But if you take a, a Intel, I'm just saying it's a 32 bit processor, the instruction size it's varied from 1 to 18 bytes. So here, uh, so right, it won't be, isn't it? So, okay, uh, so this is very important. When I'm saying any microprocessor as 32 bit microprocessor, so it clearly says that the data size it can manipulate. What is the maximum data size it can manipulate? Because um, in the coding, we have, uh, yeah, the coding, uh, the previous part also we have seen, right? We have we have an opcode and we have registers, right? So, so uh, destination registers, contemporary registers, some source registers. All the registers are what? I mean, some 5 5 bits. So each register size is the 32 bit. You got it or not? Each register size is 32 bit. So, I mean, so uh, which is capable, uh, that maximum data size it can capable. Clear? Yeah. So when I'm saying something as an 8 bit processor or a 32 bit processor, so clearly right here the word is purely for what? The data size. What is the data size the processor is going to operate? So, whatever the data size, the data bus is also the same piece. Okay. So, if you take, uh, uh, let it be here, right, we have a microprocessor. This is, assume that this is the microprocessor chip. If it is an 8 bit processor, we have like this D0 to D7, like D1, D2, so many things will be there. So, this will be connected to the memory. So, D0 to D7. Got it or not? Okay, so this one, right? The, I mean, I, I, yesterday I told you, right? Every um, every location is capable to do an eight bit data. Okay, if it is a sixteen bit, assume right. If it is D fifty, so two bytes will be I mean parallelly, right? We are going to transfer two bytes. So that's what, right? So when I'm saying this eight bit or thirty two bit processor, it clearly says the uh, data that it can operate. Okay, the next one. Uh, what's the next number I gave? Address bus, what is that? So here the uh, 8 bit processor or 32 bit or the data bus, it's always some say, I mean, it will be equal in number. Whatever the data size it can operate, that much uh, data bus we have. Okay. What is address bus? Okay, I said, uh, okay, let it be 16 address lines, which means as here. We have how many address lines? We have 16 address lines. A not two, A 15. What for this? What is the use of address bus? I was uh, uh, I will put the question in different way. Um, uh, hope like this story is under you know. Mm, like when you just go with your systems, 
you have a, i mean you have your uh, memory will be there right your hard disk will be there your ram will be there and the processor will be there uh, though we have like 1 tb 2 tb hard disk right we will be much worry about the ram isn't it so whether your ram is like 4 gb or 8 gb or 16 gb so why we are giving that much concentration is probably like right? the speed is the matter right we have more uh, i mean the size of the ram is high the processor speed will also be high because the thing is the processor knows only the ram it doesn't know about the hard disk okay it will never know about the hard disk only the processor is in contact with only with the ram memory so what will happen whenever you just go for executions the processor right uh, sorry yeah whenever you just go for an executions so whatever the data that is residing in your hard disk will be comes will be bring to the ram and from ram the program will be executed this is the normal story and the operating system is playing all those roles so which is taking the responsibility of taking the program from the hard disk and putting onto the ram and then executing and once the instruction goes to the processor it will execute this is what it is happening so from the same it, it is clear right uh, ram plays the vital role because whatever we need to execute all it is going to the ram so that's what i am saying say suppose if we have like 4 gb ram assume your application is 8 gb so what will happen what will happen so availability is only 4 gb ram or oh, your your application is 8 gb ram will it run first it first of all it will hang man yeah maybe hang or it may be some delay because uh, this don't think that If your application size is greater than the RAM size, um, it won't work at all because it will, it won't be there. And don't think that uh, ours is the only application that is going to get run because background in background so many processes and executions. So there, are, right? Some swapping will be happens, paging swapping, so many things. Maybe in next year in operating system you may read it. Okay. So because whatever the program we are going to do, it will be divided into some blocks. So it will load it into block block size. So that by right, uh, it may execute, but uh, it may be it may be slower. That's why right we are concentrating on RAM size. So now my question is, uh, since RAM is important, as we are um, what is that? As we are capable to put one TB hard disk or two TB hard disk, why don't you? Why can't we put uh, like one TB RAM? Ah, so it will become less. Will there be any restrictions in putting the RAM size for the processors or whatever it is? Ma'am, we are using RAM for the speed that will get reduced. Yeah, you see, we are using speed for doing programs speedily. Hmm. In less time, we can do a lot of program. If we use large number of RAM, the speed gets decreased. Okay. Yeah, that's the question. Oh, okay. You hear the. Can you please repeat the question? Question is this. Ah, uh, see, when they are going for executing some RAM, part of the program that is residing in hard disk will move to the RAM because processor knows only the RAM. So my question is: Is there any restriction on RAM size? Yes, sir. RAM is expensive, and we have a secondary memory. Okay, I am just I am not going to give any any I mean any amount. Whatever the. But if you increase the if you increase the size of RAM, that RAM uh, address can also increase more. Hmm. Yeah. That's what I am saying. Okay. So the question or is it is this is there any restriction in RAM size? Yes, there is the restriction. You cannot just like that put the RAM size. My we cannot add a RAM size, so which is restricting that here clearly, right? This point address bus is the one which is my handwriting will be it will be lost. So try to manage. Okay, so this is the one which is restricting the RAM size because okay, let it be here, right? Assume okay, let it be. I just going here. I have ten number of address line is. Since you have ten address lines, so what is the maximum um, possible address space we have? Two to the power ten. Okay, so two to the power ten is what? One KB. So which means a processor with 
ten address lines. Okay, if your processor with ten address lines, what is the maximum RAM size we can put for that? It is one k. We cannot put it. Why? Because we have only ten address lines. So ten address lines will be there. Okay. So first all will be zero 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 zero. What is the till right? It will go to one 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 one. Okay. Only that many combination is possible. So only those many addresses we can get. Understood or not? Okay. So your address lines clearly uh, says what is the maximum address space the processor can access. So only with that right we can just put the RAM size. Understood or not? Okay. So this is what I'm saying. Suppose if we have uh, assume like we have it. So two to the power sixteen. If the if the processor is having sixteen address bus. Address bus line. I mean, if we have sixteen address bus lines. So what is the maximum RAM we can add to that? It is clearly right to power. Uh, so if you want, you can split up into this two power ten into two power six. What is two power ten is KB. One KB, isn't it? Two power six is sixty four. So sixty four KB. So if your processor is with two to the power sixteen, so maximum is sixty four. So in the same question here also, right? If it is like I think two power twenty-four, can anyone say what is the maximum memory size that the processor can interface? What to the power twenty-four? Sixteen MB. Sixteen MB. Yeah. So you have to power twenty. Write it like this: two power twenty into two to the power four. What is two power twenty? Is one MB, isn't it? So two power four is what? Sixteen. So sixteen MB. Got it. So I mean, this what the restriction on RAM size is clearly depends upon the address bus, and the data bus is clearly says the what is the data size the processor can operate, and the next thing. One more is I/O bus. So what is that I/O bus? What is I/O bus? These things are not having. I didn't see you or not. Are you forgot? See, reason just when you go with the I/O buses again. The I mean, uh, because I hope I told you already, right? You have only the CPU alone. Will you will you agree that this is going to be a system? So suddenly not, right? So what is that? It has to be communicate with the I/O devices. So input and the uh, uh, output devices. Okay, so if a CPU wants to communicate with the outside world, all can be done with respect to the input and the output devices. Again, the question will comes to how many devices it can communicate. Can we communicate this like that, or uh, is there any restrictions on the devices? So again, right, this is the matter. Okay, so I/O bus. So assume that if we have a uh, eight bus, so eight bit I/O lines. So it again right to the power eight. So maximum two fifty six. So the total number of devices that can be connected here is two fifty six. Okay, and other than that, you might have heard this word also. I don't know. Okay, we have finished it up this like this. Okay, two fifty six devices can be connected. So here, what is happening here? It is uh, which means uh, literally uh, happening is see every devices will have some address. So in a memory, you may have some address. So whatever the devices, say some input devices, needs to communicate with the CPU, all communications will be happen through this memory address. So we will assign a port address for each devices. So we can say this is the port address. So assign a port address for each devices. And with respect to that, again you have uh, two terms: memory map, I/O map. What is this? Have you heard this word?
Yes, have you heard this? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. What is that? Memory map, you use yeah. common bus, ma'am. Same address space is used for the both. Uses common bus. Address bus. Yes, exactly. See, listen, uh, when you give it as a memory bus, assume right I have 1 KB RAM, let it be. Just for an example, I'm saying, if you have an 1 KB RAM, and here, right, we have, assume we have 256, in, in this size, in, in this itself, 256 locations will be dedicated for the I.O. Okay, so this is memory map. But when you take an I.O. map, we have this 1 KB uh, memory, other than that, for an I.O. we have a separate memory. So since it is I.O. memory, so we have a separate bus. But here, right through the common bus itself, we can be able to get the data. But we need to be very careful. We, we shouldn't overlap with our systems. Okay, so that makes the difference between the memory map and the I.O. map. The available memory itself, we can use it here. But when you came with the I.O. map, we will have a separate memory. And the other advantage of memory map is, um, uh, right away. Since, as I told you, simply right, we are data, we are moving the data to the memory, and from here CPS will take like this, right? Only the uh, data transfer. So when you give the uh, memory cases, we can use the normal data transfer instructions to work with the IOs. That is very important. But when you just go with the IO map, you have special IO instruction. Only with the help of special IO instructions, we need to work. Because we have a separate IO memory, so only with the, uh, like uh, uh, something like in and out, all those things will be there. So only with those instructions, we can uh, do it. But here, right, with the data transfer instructions, like move something, we can able to access the devices. Okay, That's the difference. Okay, so these three things you just keep remember, address bus, data bus, and the IO buses. So this was size of the address space. Okay, for this I have taken. And next one is the memory management. Oh, this is what I told you, right? Um, most of the, I mean, it has been dated back to, what you say, long back, right? This things has come down. The paging and the segmentation. Just now I told you, right? Suppose if you have a eight, um, uh, assume that you have let's say, four GB memory and your application is eight KB memory. So uh, will it be feasible to do it? Yeah, it will be feasible because, so what happened is, assume that this is your program size of eight KB. So what they will, uh, 8 GB, okay? Available is only 4 GB. So what will happen is, so first they will take it, they will divide your things into segment, assume like 1 GB, 1 GB, okay? First they will divide it into segment. So this is a segment. After segment, again, this will be divided into pages of size, I think 4 KB. So this is the pages. And later this will be loaded into the main memory. So normally this will happen. Okay, to carry out this process, there is some unit called MMU, Memory Management Unit in Processors. So with that support in processor and with the support from OS, we are enjoying the facilities. Okay, so this we are saying it as a memory management unit. Um, uh, so thus almost nowadays all those things has been supported. And the next one is the protections. So that is very important. Um, because uh, almost everything, every applications uh, will need a, a protections. And again, right, nowadays virtual machines also comes into play. So why it is virtual machines? Uh, because I told you, right, so most of the things are platform, platform independent. So when it is platform independent, uh, virtual machines has to take care of. So I think later you may read all these things. Okay. And uh, other than that, right, uh, the floating point operations, IO interfaces, like how to interface the devices with the various cables, the what are the operating system and the networks and the programming languages. So all those things are all important functional requirement. So we need to just go for a computer uh, architecture design. Okay. So, so with that, uh, this topic is any doubt in this? Any doubt with this? Any any where you have a doubt?
clear now. Uh, today morning only I posted this session, I mean last sessions and uh, last PPTs. Uh, just sorry for that. Uh, so any doubt? No. Oh, it's almost lunch is ready. Shall we move to the next topic? Yes, ma'am. Okay, is it visible? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. So the next topic is trends in technology. See, I mean, the previous uh, session, right? I mean, the previous uh, slides, we have been discussing about the instruction set architecture. Whenever you are going to design a computer architecture, ISA uh, instruction set architectures plays a vital role. And, and at the same time, whenever just we are going to design this, I mean, not me, when the computer architecture people, when you are going to design this ISA, and it has to be um, survived the rapid changes in the computer technology. This is very important. So, well, you suppose if you are going to uh, deliver an ISA, at least right, it must be, it should be exist for at least for a decade. So then only right we can say it is going to be a successful isa so with that with the change of technology we cannot go on change the architecture it shouldn't be like this so uh, i mean like when you are developing the isa uh, it is something like a forecasting kind of things we need to go with the we need to think about the technology and accordingly right we have to uh, design the isas so here right uh, uh, here they are just going with the, uh, five uh, technologies Okay, and the five things that has to be in mind when you are going to design the instruction set architecture. Okay, the first one is the, uh, uh, here it just we are talking about the Moore's law. So Moore's law, uh, it states, right, the number of transistors that is there for building up the uh, microprocessor is doubling over a period of 18 to 12 months. So that we are saying it as Moore's law, which means, right, the transistors. I, I think even in digital also we read, right? So first it says like in SSI, then LS, uh, MSI, then LSI, then PLSI. So what makes the difference? The number of gates involved in designing it, isn't it? Okay. So when it is a gate similar, then it comes into the transistors, right? So the transistors uh, involved in designing the chip will be doubled over a period of 18 to 24 months. So that right we are saying it as most law. Or also, right, we can say the transistor density increases 35 percentage per year, or uh, quadrupling around four years. Okay, um, this is uh, this is what they are saying. It the number of transistors is uh, keep increasing. So with that in mind, your instruction set architecture has to get designed. The next one is uh, the DRAM. The first one is IC technology. The next one is the DRAM. Uh, you know about RAM, right? Uh, uh, I mean, when you just talk as RAM, two things, right? One is as uh, yes, RAM, you have another one is as the DRAM. Do you have both the RAM in processor? I think memory, yeah, something you read in your uh, last unit in CO. Do you have both the memory in RAM? Uh, sorry, in processor? Because there is some Thing different with respect to architecture. I'm not uh, going much deeper into that because when you just take the DRAM, as a, I think you have some capacitor and the transistor, something will be there with respect to architecture aspects. And in case of SRAM, uh, it is uh, only the transistor part. Since uh, some uh, leakage will be there, I think they'll say it has to be refreshed periodically. So that's why DRAM will be slower. So these are all the stories behind the DRAM and the SRAM, and the SRAM will be faster. Okay, also this is the base stories. Now, right, do you think that the both the RAMs are present in our system? Hmm. 
Do you think that Ram is present in all the story? Asti Yuga Pajit Kastin. Do you accept that Ram we have in our system? Can anyone say, like, uh, what is the hierarchy of memory? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. Can anyone say the hierarchy, memory hierarchy? Register, catch it. Okay, uh, yeah, correct. First one is the register, okay, yeah. from top, right? Register, we have, then cache. After that? Primary memory. Secondary. Yeah, secondary memory. Okay. I think we'll finish up with this. Okay. Just as, uh, I mean, no need to defend, you are very familiar. It's a collection of flip-flops. And you can say it's a processor memory, so which has been designed already. Now, what what is this cache and what is that primary memory? Why we have this uh, hierarchy level? What is the advantage of having this? Speed. Speed, yeah, right. whichever is nearer to processor. Mm -hmm. right? Speed, right? So the same thing, whichever is closer to the processor, speed. So accessibility will be, access time will be less, but at the same time, which is more? Secondary memory is more. Okay, uh, I mean, uh, assume that this is your ALU, along with that you will have a registers. Then you are saying you have a cache, then you have a primary memory and you have a secondary memory. So, whichever is closer to uh, memory, right? Two things, one is space will be less. Okay, so in these cases, space may be less, that is the one thing. And the second thing is, but with respect to the accessibility speed, access time will be low. Okay, access time will be low. But can anything be reduced? Cost, cost will be cost per GB. Okay, cost is a matter, right? Because uh, this is the one. So, cost, right? It will get decreased. Compared to your cash or primary memory, to secondary memory, the cost is the matter. Okay, this is a general thing. Okay, I am just talking about this RAM and DRAM. So, where we are using SRAM and where we are using DRAM here? Cache and all SRAM, primary memory. Yeah, right? So, keep remember. So, when you just cache, right? We are, it is all about SRAM. Cache is a SRAM. Sorry. So, cache is the SRAM and the DRAM is your primary memory. So, okay, this is what I uh, mean, just remember this. The remaining operations are all, uh, you know, it but in general, right? Your primary memory is the DRAM and the cache is the SRAM. Okay, so, and even right when you just go with the DRAM chip, it is increases about 20 to 25 to 40 percentage per year. So, doubling roughly over to two years. As we just discussed with respect to the transistors. As uh, similarly, right, if you, the DRAM is also the similar case, but it, I mean, it is not as like as the number of transistors involved, but uh, here also, right, um, the growth rate is uh, somewhat uh, more. So, the computer IEC people has to be considered this also. The another one, the flash memory. So, here, what is flash memory? Secondary. Nowadays, right, uh, uh, nowadays, if suppose if you are going to buy a laptop, okay, the first thing is we are looking to RAM. What is the next thing you are just looking onto that? It won't say there's the NVMe. Other than that, yes, 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 right. We are just we are, we, are, uh, we are using the laptop efficiently, right? So we, did, we couldn't able to tolerate a single second because loading it from hard disk is much, much lower than the uh, SSD. And right? nowadays, right, we are just moving on to this SSD, solid state, right? So these things are uh, comes into picture nowadays, okay? So, uh, so a solid state drive. Uh, and not only in PMD, even every case is right. Uh, we are just, uh, I mean, SSD has get it, uh, increased. 
So and also right the capacity per flash has been increased about fifty to sixty percentage per year recently. Because uh, I remember when when the SSD came came into picture, uh, they said right two fifty six, isn't it? KB two fifty six KB. So now right even SSD is also uh, in terms of GB or even in terms of TB it is okay. So and uh, here right this one the flash memory is fifty to twenty times cheaper. A bit than the DRAM. This is what I told you, right? When you just go with the cost aspect, so uh, uh, here, right? Uh, I mean, primary memory will be your DRAM, and the secondary memory. The secondary memory can be replaced here as only as the uh, flash memory. It can be a flash memory, or it can be your disk drives. Clear or not? So comparatively, if you just go with the cost, so the per bit it will be in case of DRAM, it will be much costier, costier compared to the Flash memory. That's all. And the next one is the network technology. Okay, the first one is IC, and the next one is the DRAM, and the third one is the flash memory, and the fourth one is the network technology. So here, I mean, there is no impact on IC here. So purely right here, the performance. I mean, network performance purely depends upon the performance of the switches. And on the transmission system, so here nothing is related with the instruction set architecture. Um, and the last one is the magnetic disk technology. So magnetic disk technology is like your hard disk. So we are not using it for nowadays, but uh, yeah, still some systems. But the thing is, right? This technology is widely used in server and macro scale computers. Still in servers and macro macro scale storage, they are using only the magnetic disk technologies. Even hard disk, okay, your hard disk. So those things will be useful. Uh, the, but our cases under PMD or laptop under right, we are just moved to the flash memories. Um, so this what earlier right, um, the density right, it is increased thirty percentage per year, and then right sixty percentage, and even hundred percentage. There is a um, in, in the size it keep increasing. So since 2004, what happened is it is dropped 40 by 40 percentage per year or uh, doubled every three years. So it has been happened. And again, this times, so disks are 15 to 25 times cheaper per bit than the flash memory. So as I said, right? So DRAM is costlier uh, than uh, than the flash. Similarly, flash is costlier than the hard disk. Okay. So given the uh, Stored growth rate of DRAM, disk are now 30 to 50, I mean 300 to 500 times cheaper per bit than the DRAM. This is for the flash, this is for the DRAM. See, uh, one thing I need to say, definitely right when you just go, suppose they ask me to set the question paper on computer architecture, definitely this first chapter I will never take. Right from third chapter only I will take. But you don't know, people, they may take anything from this, they will ask this question also. Disk are does times cheaper per bit than flash. You may get a questions like this also. Just please, please, please kindly go through these uh, PPTs. I think uh, I'm, I won't recommend to go with the uh, textbook for chapter one. So whatever there are in the textbooks, almost all has been consolidated and it has been put onto your uh, 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 PPT. So just go with the PPT, okay? And try to read your, the, every lines. Uh, we can't expect what questions they are going to ask because after this. Maybe in the next Saturday you may have a test on chapter one. Chapter one, not unit one. Chapter one you may have a test. Again, it's going to be a common test uh, between you and the SRC people because SRC is also having the subjects. So it's going to be a common test. So be ready and kindly go through the PPTs for the first uh, chapter. And uh, the next thing is whenever just we are going to develop a product, the two things. One is right, it is going to be cost effective and at the same time, right, it has to meet up the performance. Okay. So when you just talk as a performance, again, two important things has to be uh, in mind. One is the bandwidth or throughput. The other one is the latency or the response times. So bandwidth here, but just talk about the total amount of work done in a given time. And the latency is the time taken between the start and the completion of the event. So, with respect to performance, these two are the important, and the cost is also a major important factor. Okay, so this I mean this is the commonly trends when you are just going for design, 
is a common question, right? The cost performance, how about the cost and the performance is a matter. Other than that, we need to worry about the remaining design issues also. As I told you, instruction set architecture. When you are designing an instruction set architecture, parallelly, right, we need to keep in mind of these technologies. One is the integrated circuit IC technology, DRAM, flash memory, solid state drives on the network technology should be in your mind while designing it. So in general, I mean, uh, they given a graph says that, uh, uh, I mean, the improvement, when you just go with the improvement, the throughput has been increased to 10,000 to 25,000, uh, but the latency uh, shows the improvement to 32 AD. See here, just in the graph they have shown here. Okay, so this is the latency improvement over a period. So it is uh, roughly from 32 AD is like this, but here when you just go with the bandwidth improvement, bandwidth is the number of um, amount of work that is done in a given time. So that is increasing more comparative to the Response. Yeah. So uh, this is with respect to trends in technology. Okay. Five things. So just keep remember. One is the IC technology, semiconductor. Sorry, DRAM, flash memory, this technology, and finally, right, it should be cost effective and also it should be performance. When you talk us performance, bandwidth or throughput or latency or response time, that is very two, two important measures for performance. Okay, so what is bandwidth? The total amount of work done in a given time, and the latency is the time between the start and the completion of the events. Okay. So any doubt in this? This all those topics are like storytelling only. So don't think that I'm just projecting the PPT and explaining since uh, nothing to explain uh, in a written format, I'm just taking up the PPTs. So chapter three, right? Wherever I need, I will write it and then I explain it. Don't worry. Don't think that I will just simply go with the PPT. Please. Shall I move to the next one?